Thank you, Brian. So um, our topic is the most sexy topic of the day, and that is blockchain solutions for state and local government. Um, we have a rock star panel. We will be talking about um, what solutions have been implemented and what we see on the near horizon. And if we have time, then we'll delve into what we would like to see in the future. Um, I'm gonna let our panelists introduce themselves. I'll start really quickly. I know you already heard all about my blockchain stuff, so I'll tell you a little bit different about me. I think every time I get on, I should have a different bio. Maybe it's like two truths and a lie, and you guys can tell me which one's a lie. <laughs> So a uh, little bit about myself. Prior to joining government, uh, I received a degree in automotive technology, and I worked at Caterpillar, the tractor and diesel engine company, for 12 years. I was a continuous product improvement engineer at the Skidster Loader Factory, and then I worked in the on-highway truck division and the building construction products division as a field service engineer, which is why I think of things methodically. And um, during the evenings, I limelight as the mother of six beautiful children. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All of that is true. All right, Doug. Thanks, Amelia. Doug Lyles here. Um, well, since you mentioned children, I'll lead with I have five children, so you got me by one. Wow. So, yeah, I know. It's kind of makes me nervous just to even say it out loud. If Russell has one, then we have like an even dozen. I actually don't have many. So I'm an elected of official commissioner of a special district in northwest Florida. Uh, we do water management, uh, mosquito control, uh, and uh, so I also am CEO of Good Combinator, so we are a startup accelerator. Uh, we're currently building an artificial intelligence campus in Santa Rosa Beach, which is northwest Florida. Fantastic. And he has the coolest ring ever. Yeah. Anyway, um, incredibly cool ring. Um, I'm Russell Castanero. I, uh, I'm actually the uh, um, investment steward for Buffercorn Ventures, which is a, a you know, why is a venture capital guy up here talking about state government? That's because I've worked um, in, in or around state government for about 24 years. Uh, 20 of them was in Hawaii, where I ran, my company did all of the e-government and e-commerce um, for the state. And so um, if you wanted to order Obama's birth certificate, you did that online through <laughs> us. And we rejected it and took your money. Um, but we still, you did. Um, and we were the first state to do um, online um, wedding permits and, and mar you know, marriage certificates and um, things like uh, all, all sorts of great e-government stuff that um, brought Hawaii to the top of the, the list of states as far as access to e-government services in 2014. Um, an interesting thing happened on the way to work one day, which was uh, um, our legislature in Hawaii was the first, were the first ones to legalize cannabis. And as a result, um, we had all these people applying to do medical dispensaries in Hawaii, and it was $10,000 to do it, and nobody c could get checking accounts. So, um, so we implemented a Bitcoin-based payment system for them, uh, which was really exciting. And of course, me and a lot of my staff went all the way down the, the rabbit hole um, and bought as much pizza as we could. No. Um, and we, uh, <laughs> damn it. Uh, but. Uh, the um, way you lower your voice when you say cannabis. Yeah, cannabis. <laughs> but in Colorado now you say mushrooms. That's, um, yeah, but it's the same thing exactly. Psilocybin. Yes, so, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, regardless, I, I don't want to take all the time here talking about me, but, uh, um, but that got me into it. And of course, the ten, 10 days after we released that payment system, um, the banking commissioner went and got the legislature to require a paper check, so we couldn't take the uh, take Bitcoin there anymore. But that sort of got me going, and then I started uh, WAMPAY, which was an early member of GBA, doing uh, e-commerce, um, crypto commerce, regardless of whether you had a bank or not. Um, and then, um, through because of some of the experience I had in Hawaii, I was working with the Bureau of Conveyances, and they did recordings. We were a state ro statewide recording office for um, titles and everything like that. And we were going to do a pilot on ETH, on Ethereum, to do a titling system until we realized that there was no digital identity. 
And so to sign everything, you'd have to paper it out and then rescan it. And it was like, that makes no sense uh, at all. Like, even like, I really wanted to do it. We even had somebody that was willing to pay for it. And I was like, this is a waste of our time um, if we don't have that. But that informed me when I got to Colorado and uh, Governor Polis, who's our governor, said, you know, state government, we're in blockchain for the win. This was about three, a little more than three years ago. And I was there at the Capitol and I said, hey, do you want to let me implement you know, state, I, you know, state ID, um, except electronic? And so I took over as the uh, director of digital transformation for the state, drove uh, among a bunch of other things, um, the digital ID, so you can have a driver's license. We have almost two million people using a digital ID now in Colorado, um, which is around 40% of the eligible population that could have it, which is freaking impressive. Thank you, I deserve that. Um, and, uh, and our team was amazing that we did it to really prove that the big companies that were doing the I IDs at the time, that we could do it a lot cheaper than they could. We did it again with verifiable credentials on, um, on immunizations. So you can go and show your immunization card basically by using the app. The app pulled in all the information from the centralized immunization database and made it super easy to comply during the end of days, which we all lived through. Um, no one here is that young. Um, so everybody lived through it. Um, then I went on, and after, after implementing all that, once we hit a million people signed up for it, I was like, okay, I can go do my next thing, and uh, went, into, um, went into Buffcorn Ventures. And we, um, we have a um, thing called Colorado Jam, where we work with state government and municipal government to fund and staff pilot projects for blockchain um, and prove their viability um, in, in, you know, in concert with these state officials who are the SMEs. So really excited about that. I could talk more, but, uh, but then I'd be even a, bit a, a jerk here. So I'm, I'm gonna stop now. No, I think uh, as we head into what things have been done, I think we just had a whole list of things that have been done, right? Oh, so I thought I was supposed to do it, sorry. No, it's okay, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and as we look at that, I mean, maybe if we just do a, a quick recap. So we have things that have been done both you did in Hawaii and, and, and I did in Utah. We have so that government entities are accepting cryptocurrency as a form of payment. I know areas of, of Florida are doing that as well. Colorado is. Colorado is as well. So we do have a lot of areas that local governments are accepting cryptocurrency as a form of payment. Uh, we have licensing, right? Both of us have done have done marriages and we've got certified digital documents in, in Utah. I know Col um, California has a bill that allows certified digital documents. Um, what, one of the things we haven't talked about is um, what, what you're doing, Doug, and, and how that uh, you're using blockchain to help with the environment. Yes, so we have a, um, a bay estuary that's downstream of a lot of rapid development. So COVID kind of um, supercharged our tourism industry in Northwest Florida, and we are the fastest growing county in Florida right now, and one of the fastest in the country. But the way that they determine water quality standards as far as stormwater runoff is, it has to do with population. Well, we have a relatively low population uh, in Santa Rosa Beach, uh, South Walton, Florida. So we don't have as strict a standards to protect our downstream estuary. So we uh, what we're what we've done is we have uh, environmental sensors, real-time sensors that detect nitrogen in different areas surrounding the bay. So we're working toward having 24 stakeholders uh, surrounding the bay, and these sensors uh, feed into a cloud-based AI system that gives us uh, recommendations about where we could get the most bang for the buck. And um, so that's set up as a, uh, like a community and um, it, it can be voted on and determine where funds are to be spent. That's fascinating. Um, and I know that uh, some of the other areas that we haven't talked about yet um, are land titling. Uh, there's places that state and local governments are doing land titling right now. Um, and also voting, but we will. There will be a panel later uh, on voting on the blockchain. But those are all things that are done at the at the state and local level. Um, now, as we delve into blockchain as a state and local issue, sometimes you get a, a maverick like one of us that just comes in and.
finds a solution and implements that solution. But oftentimes there has to be underlying legislation that uh, or rule changes or policies that need to be put in place either to allow the blockchain or to just ensure that the use of technology is done within the proper uh, bounds of government. Um, I'm wondering, what do you guys think are the most important things for a state or, lo or local government considering blockchain adoption? What types of policies, rules, or legislation would you recommend? Uh, well, I would say, well, uh, just to just to sort of highlight your point here, this question is how long? Wh when did you start at the recording office? Uh, so clerk? in uh, 2019. 2019. So by then, uh, electronic signature laws had pretty much become. But but 10 years earlier, that was a big deal. Like being able to take electronic signatures. I don't mean like digitally signed stuff. I mean that you signed electronically and said, "I signed this." I say yes. Yeah, say yes. So so I, I say that because. These kind of like stupid issues you think are intuitively, of course, that's all right. It takes a long time for them to go through. And the number of people that can say no to something in any bureaucracy and double that for government, um, you know, are, there's a, it, it can get stopped up in a lot of different ways. So, so to ask, like, what is it that we really need? Well, we have a, a, a real lack of any case law. Around uh, around things like digital securities and around things like if there were somebody was somebody was to get sued, um, and in title, I mean, just from working with the Bureau of Conveyances, you had people that had disputes over who really owned something, and a lot there's a lot of scams out there. They're trying to sell people trying to sell people properly property that they don't even have title to, right? Um, and so that kind of law will make the title companies and the mortgage companies a lot more comfortable dealing with a, a completely digital titling system. Um, the same thing goes for um, things like, um, like patents and copyrights and things like that. You know, uh, everybody's probably familiar with the poor man's copyright and, and like it's a, you mail it to yourself or registered mail or you take a picture of yourself in front of this newspaper, which by the way isn't true. But, um, but, uh, but all sorts of things you can do with the technology that can prove unequivocally, <laughs> you know, mathematically prove that you can assert that this is your product, you know, or that you're the first one to register it. And really clarifying that, and it can happen through a law that's passed, and normally these things have to pass in like three or four states before the federal government can go and, and, and follow it up, as opposed to like model, model language, which comes down from the federal government a lot of times, but, uh, but has to be implemented in each state. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to start just accepting it. Um, but that like that proof that that legal we know like ma with the math and with the science that these things are true but making it so that, that it means it's true to a court is, is really the most important thing that we can do and you can talk about like other things about titles and making it so you don't have to pay taxes like Gerard had to when he was buying things for five dollars in, in crypto at a time you know you don't have to do um, you know, capital gains taxes and everything. But really, the foundational stuff we need is acceptance in court. Yeah, I think, um, and to, to further your point, when I came in in 2019, even though almost every state had e-signature uh, legislation and laws on the books, my county wasn't using it. Right. As clerk, I was in charge of executing um, over a thousand contracts a year, and each one of those contracts was getting blue three ink, to blue, four blue, 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 blue ink signatures. Blue ink. Three to four wet blue ink signatures, and that was one of the first things I did was implement DocuSign, um, which, you know, fortuitously, I'm now the commission chair, and I have to sign every one of those thousands of contracts, and I thank myself every day <laughs> for implementing <laughs> DocuSign as I'm sitting on an airplane pushing buttons. buttons. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and so... Uh, abs uh, and you talk about having those laws on the books. Um, we were actually just talking during the birds of a feather reception that uh, there's a gentleman here from the Embassy of Israel, and my marriage certificates are accepted in Israel, and we actually had a Supreme Court case that went to Israel, and we had a unanimous verdict in the Supreme Court because we were able to show um, laws on the books in both the United States nationally and in the state of Utah locally, uh, giving us providence for those marriages. Uh, so that's a that's a huge point. I think on that, there's in th important things to talk about, maybe property rights, but when we think of property rights, we're thinking of land, right? But we need to think of digital property rights, intellectual property rights, digital property rights. If you own a digital asset, um, do you own that? That's 
uh, that's a great way to, th to think of it um, and to look at how would these, you have to have rules in place that if this is arbitrated, if we do go to court, there's somewhere that we can do that. Um, how about you, Doug? Do you have any? So yeah, my, my comment as far as legal, um, you know, a lot of times to affect change, you have, you have to have a carrot and a stick. And you gotta be willing to litigate things. This is a little bit different than what you're talking about, but that's the way that I end up being an elected official. Because I bought a lot that was on the bay, this estuary that I'm trying to protect, and there's a um, stormwater ditch that goes down the middle of it. And every time it would rain hard, if it had not rained for a while, all the fish would die. You'd, you'd see them floating out there, and I, I worked on it for year after year after year. Well, over time, I ended up following a lawsuit against them and against the county <clears throat> and against mosquito control, settled the lawsuit against mosquito control, and then still have the one going on against the county, and that's where we're doing the settlement to have the money for the Dow to protect the estuary. So my point of saying all that is that you have to understand the legal landscape to see what the legal precedent, what is the law, what is the precedent, depending on what the case use, uh, use case is, it, it, like, Florida Supreme Court a lot of times, or the just U.S. Supreme Court. And now that we've got these automated AI agents, you can run these scenarios through automatically where it'll go through and you've got a legal agent that'll check what it is that you're trying to do. Like, I want to do this thing. What is legal precedent? What are my challenges going to be? What's my risk? What's my reward? And you can do all these things just like this. Yeah, and I think to make that point, when I talked about the case that went to the Supreme Court, it was actually the Israeli Supreme Court that was deciding whether or not my marriages in, in Utah were legal. So that talks a little bit as we go into a, a, a global environment, keeping in mind that the, the things that you implement in your locality can have an impact in other places, particularly as we're looking at emerging technology, because if a court doesn't have a local case that they can refer to, using things like AI, they'll start looking for any case anywhere that they can refer to. Well, let's shift from what we have done into what things uh, lie in the near future. Um, I would love to hear from both of you on what things you see that are, that are maybe in process right now or coming down the pipeline uh, in state and local government with regards to emerging technology and blockchain. Well, one thing I think that's really interesting and it's related a bit to DAOs, um, but a little different as well, is uh, funding public goods. Um, these are things that are really in the public. I, I hear a lot of people talk about public goods, and sort of it's one of those things like saying it's organic. It's, you should be, you should get your suspicions should be tweaked right away when you hear somebody talking about public good. But something like a dam or some, you know, important things that are there for the the broader population. And a lot of times, because of the political process that goes on, whether at the you know at the state or city or or federal level. Um, special interests are the ones who have control. And one of the cool things about that blockchain allows you to do is something called um, quadratic funding. Um, it's not too, and, and I think it's also, what is it, true? Or um, I, there's another word for it as well, but quadratic funding. And also quadratic voting. A lot of you may, may know about that from like ranked choice. The idea behind quadratic funding is a lot of times you have like um, partnerships with um, you know, with you know, federal funds and state funds coming into something, and then private funds. So it's a public-private partnership. What you can essentially do is allow the community to partake by providing funds for a project, and then that they're voting for it. And instead of just saying who gave the most money to it, they get the project. The amount of the population combined with some some you know algorithm that you use, and the amount of money that they gave will indicate how much of the core money that they get, and then of course everything everybody gave to that project goes in. So that, like an, an easy example for that is like, let's say you have two projects up, there's $10 million in funding that's available, and the community says, they invite the community for feedback and for sponsorship, for comp and there's like two projects. One is a parking lot in a new shopping mall, and another one is they're gonna redo an elementary school and add a, a, a daycare that can serve 500 kids in the area. And so maybe there's four companies that get together and they give um, $500,000 to the project to get it to go. And there's now 100 people who give $50 a piece um, to, um, to try and get this other thing. Well, in the sort of normal way we'd look at it, the 500K would win. 
but if you really want to get engagement from your population, you can make it so that maybe you like use a logarithmic function or something that makes it so that the amount of money is not quite as important as the, no the number of people that are actually voting for something. Um, it lets you really tweak the whole, you know, it's a little game theory here, but it really lets you tweak these things and find out what is really important to the community. And it encourages even people with very little interest. You know, a dollar means something when there's a multiplier um, to it by the number of people. And so it really does give, uh, it, it makes it hyper dem democratic. Um, I think that, that probably is, is uh, um, is something that, you know, there's kind of, I know this isn't really what tragedy of the commons is, but so often there are really good things that are good for everyone, but not good enough for everyone to counter the few special interests that it's really good for, right? And so if you, anything you Amen. can do to rebalance that over to what's good for everyone is unequivocally better than something that's only good for four people. Um, and, 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 you know, quadratic funding really goes a long way to doing that. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, Doug, do you have any projects that you would love to see uh, coming, that you either see coming down the pipeline or um, that, uh, that you could see that you'd like to see people focus on? Yes, I, I like the, the concept on the quadratic voting. So you don't, you have to decide how you're going to allocate your resources. So if something is more important to you, then you allocate more of your votes to that thing. <clears throat> and so I, I like that. I, we've not used that yet, but th that would be the thing that I would like to implement. Um, Save so much money. You, know, you don't have to do the, the, uh, um, the primaries, uh, well, right? And no runoffs. Like, look at Georgia. Every year they have 27 plant runoffs, for God's sake. But, it, but it's important to like remember. It's like $77 million, too. Right. I think that the, the technological hurdles have already been met for all the things that we want to do. I think it's the emotional hurdles that we really need to understand and go in with eyes wide open on how to, to implement real change. <clears throat> and I think that getting, um, reversing the, the apathy of the, the general population by getting them engaged, gamifying different um, crowdsource projects and things like that where they can get uh, real world assets, uh, a pizza for going to clean up the beach because there's a scan code there and you scan and you met with your friends and then, but getting those kinds of buy-in and then, then you've got a platform to say, hey, special interests are, are really need to um, watch out because if they're not looking out for the general good of the population, then we're going to call them out on it. We've got the, the army of people that have been involved with this gamification of the project that all of a sudden are not apathetic and they understand what's going on. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I know that as we look at technology, there are some states and localities that are actively fighting emerging technologies, and I think most of that is probably fear-based. It's a little bit of FUD. Um, and then we have those that are embracing it. Um, what, uh, what encouragement would you give to those in government whose local area is full of FUD and, it, and, and, are, and are fighting it? Um, and on the flip side, what caution would you give to those localities that are embracing it to make sure that it's done well? Let's we'll start with you, Russell. Okay, um, that is, uh, I could like sit here and talk with you guys over drinks for six hours on this. Um, we, can do that but, uh, we can do that at the reception afterwards. Yeah, I was going yeah, to the reception. That's, that's if you right. don't have your ticket yet, Gerardo, there's still tickets available. You can, we can do that after. So, so I think that, that the understanding that mathematical proofs are actually something um, and, and getting this concept across that, that most of the blockchain technology work on mathematical proofs that are re repeatably provable all the time. And this is like something in our very, you know, bifurcated world that not a lot of people can agree on. But if we can at least agree on math, um, we can agree on things that will enable the, the next phase of all the, the legal stuff that we're talking about, the adoption that we're talking about, that will, um, and we can have trust in it. Um, but it will take some education. And I think the, the um, so, that's really the first and most important thing, is, is, is making sure that all of government is under, it understands what a mathematical proof, just what it means, really, um, as simply as possible. The other is that not to have blind faith 
in, in you know in it because where we have seen time and time again you know it's the age old Godzilla Frankenstein you know story where we have technology and we apply it without any sort of wisdom or any sort of vision and uh, we shouldn't just use technology because it's cool or because a vendor says or because some tech weenie somewhere said that you should use it, right? We have to apply, like, why are we doing, doing this and where do we want to be and how does this get us there? Um, so there are some things that blockchain makes a lot of sense. Um, I I'll give you an example. Does it make sense that there is a, an Alexa in every room in someone's house and the only reason they use it is to play music or to ask the weather when they could, you know, play their music? I don't know. I think it's. I think my privacy is a little more important to me than than uh, than having an Alexa in my bedroom. You may feel differently, um, but that at least is a choice that I can make, and it's a choice that we should make anytime we invite a technology into our back offices, um, or our bedrooms, or our houses, or whatever it is that we need to think about. What does this mean? What's really happening here? And and that that's the scary part is if we start applying technology without wisdom, without a vision. Uh, we will make mistakes because we won't be in charge. That's great advice. Doug, do you have any final uh, two minutes or less? So I have Alexa in my bedroom. <laughs> I no. do not. No, I'm with, I want, I want I'm with AI on listening one. to everything I say and do because, <laughs> because it's there to help me. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. It's, it's there to help me. Um, so, um, but yeah. I th say again? Yes. <laughs> as far as how to affect change, this is, that's a million dollar question. At, like on the local level, my recipe that's worked well is to find out who the loudest, loudest critics are and to get them one-on-one, -on -one, not call them out online, but get them one-on-one, -on -one, do your homework before you meet with them and give them the information that they need to support what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and then in our community, uh, it's, we probably got, have 50,000 voters. There's, there's about a dozen people. If you convince those dozen people, they'll show up to the meetings and they'll get their armies to show up at the meetings and wear all the same color shirt and get the commissioners to vote however they want them to vote. That's just the way it works. But if you understand the nuance of um, having... Uh, a clear understanding with your opponents and convince them, then that's a really good way to affect change. And then policy, you know, it's like you've got to go and lobby for different things. You have to understand who the influencers are at the state level and to, at the federal level. And, you know, you, when I was in leadership of the Florida Home Builders Association, we had a saying, you're either on the menu or you're sitting at the table. So don't think it's going to go okay. If, you, if it's something you care about, you need to get involved with the policy. Yeah, thank you so much for those words of wisdom. In our last about minute and a half, I think I'll, um, I'll kind of share with you my perspective on that. I have a little bit of a different demographic. I have 700,000 constituents, and we have 350,000 active registered voters. Um, so meeting with every one of them individually isn't really an option for me. But one of the things that I try to tell people, first of all, I don't ever try to explain the technology. Nobody knows how, when I, when I send a text message to my son and he reads it and sends it back, I don't know how that happens. I just know that my son got the message and he replied. So don't try to explain the technology if you don't need to. Um, just explain the benefits. And then uh, on top of that, meet with the influencers. There's no way I can meet with every one of the 700,000 people in my constituency, but I try to meet with the influencers. And then here's the key. Not every one of them is going to agree with you. There are people that it doesn't matter how many times I tell them that these solutions are not violating privacy, that we cryptographically, you know, uh, do hashes and that nothing, no PII is on the blockchain and how it's actually giving control back to the individual and it's preserving sovereignty and privacy, they are convinced that I'm stealing their info that I got off the government issued ID. Don't argue with them. It's not <laughs> worth your time. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, also, if anybody wants, I've got free gifts. So, um, Blockchain enabled business NFC business cards. Let me know and I'll give you one. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.